Hello, I'm Susan King. I'm the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I'm very pleased to welcome Matt Winkler, who is the editor-in-chief and the co-founder of that very small news organization called Bloomberg News, which has been really uh, been a hot property, as everyone says, over the last few years. Did you ever think it'd be this big, this fast? Um, well, thank you, Susan. Um, <laughs> we started uh, with a uh, much humbler beginning. Uh, we were once one, <laughs> not many, yeah. um, but there's still uh, the energy and intensity that uh, we started with is with us today. Well, I want to talk to you about Bloomberg News because in a time when so many news organizations seem to be, you know, on the decline, Bloomberg News has come up to be a powerhouse on so many fronts. And so I really want to have our students be able to understand that. But first, I want them to understand you a little bit, because you were a journalist in college. So from your earliest uh, times, like them, they were infatuated by the idea of news and information. What was it that drew you to it? Actually, it was earlier than that. Really? I was a newspaper boy. Ah. Uh, I used to deliver an afternoon newspaper for three years. And uh, I guess the romance began when the bundle was dropped at uh, the foot of uh, my driveway. And I had to unwrap it, and I could smell the ink. And then, of course, I had to read what I was delivering. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. And I was kind of hooked on newspapers mm. from that point on. Um, now, of course, you know, newspaper delivery boys are probably an artifact now. But by the time I got to college, uh, I was very interested in newspapers. And so I, uh, in my freshman year, I applied uh, to become editor of the uh, newspaper. I didn't think I had a chance of getting it and somehow got lucky and uh, I was immediately in love. And what was it that drew you to it? The immediacy? The urgency? You know, surprise is the definition of news. Yeah. And there's no more stimulating, I think, occupation than coming to grips with surprises mm -hmm. and the meaning of surprises. And to me, that's what the news business is. Um, and that's never, it's never stopped. It's never surprising. stopped, no. I, you know, I, uh, as you say, I knew what I wanted to do and uh, was lucky in knowing that I wanted to do it. And yeah. I was also lucky in that I, I found work. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you stayed so. right in your college town. I did. Well, I was still in college, and I uh, got a summer job uh, as a newspaper uh, reporter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the newspaper decided uh, I could continue, and I did while I was still in college. So I was actually employed full time by the time I graduated, and uh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And did you know immediately that you were interested in business news because you went from there to big business organizations? Uh, funny thing that. I mm -hmm. uh, was lucky enough to do the courts, the police, uh, and politics, um, pretty much every sports, everything in between. The one story in the 70s when I was making my way that to me was without a doubt the most important was the business and economic story. Yeah. That was not a great decade uh, in the US. It was mm -hmm. a troubled decade economically, and, and uh, many companies went through uh, real retrenchment. Um, and it's the one subject I didn't know a lot about. So I said uh, to myself, this is really where I ought to be, mm. and uh, resolved that that's what I was going to do. And how did you do that? You didn't have a business degree well, or a journalism degree? The newspaper that I admired the most uh -huh. uh, as I was, um, you know, making my way was uh, the Wall Street Journal. I admired it for the quality of its reporting, writing, editing was flawless. Uh, you never saw a misplaced comma or modifier uh, anywhere. Uh, it was a newspaper that said a thousand words is worth a picture uh, <laughs> and uh, didn't print any pictures right. um, back then. And uh, so, that's where I wanted to be, and it uh, wasn't long before that's where I landed and uh, was very happy. Was it hard to get that first job at Wall Street Journal? Uh, was it hard? Yeah, I suppose it was. Uh, when you're young and you think you can do anything um, or anything's possible, which is what I believed, um, it happened. So, um, you know, I mean, and the way it happened was I, I think I was one of the few people who showed up at lunch hour, handed an application to the head of personnel who looked at me like I was crazy and said, can I fill out an application and all this, you know, and did so on the spot. 
and uh, actually two weeks later I, um, I got a letter uh, from the then managing editor of the Wall Street Journal and uh, he said dear Mr. Winkler we have no openings for you now or in the future. <laughs> um, so I put the letter away and said, okay, I'll call him in six months. And then two weeks after that, I got a phone call from the New York bureau chief who said, you may have received a letter. Uh, disregard it. Can you come in for an interview? Now, I never figured out what that was all about, uh, but I did go in for an interview, and he said, uh, I've looked at your, uh, your clips and uh, what you've done, and um, maybe in six months we'll have an opening for you. And uh, sure enough, that's what happened. See, I always push people on these kinds of stories because it proves persistence wins out, right? Young journalists think you need to know someone. No, you got to be persistent. Uh, you know, I felt it was the right place for me. Yeah. This is where I thought I belonged, and sure enough, it is where I wound up, and I was very happy. Well, um, one of our trustees, Peter Grauer, of course, is connected to Bloomberg News, recently told a story of, uh, that while you were at the Wall Street Journal, you interviewed a man named Michael Bloomberg. Well, it was more in a way a, uh, uh, a moment of great existential angst that led me to Bloomberg and the reason for that is uh, you know by the time uh, I um, would meet him I had covered markets financial markets the economy especially overseas and I had become familiar with uh, something called the Bloomberg, which uh, was becoming ubiquitous on the most important desks of uh, government securities traders. And what I realized from uh, this system called the Bloomberg, this information system, computerized, this little computer monitor blinking at people, was that it provided more insight and perspective, usually three or four weeks before I would figure it out in a yeah. column at the Wall Street Journal. And back then we thought, we were the ones who were delivering the first word and the fastest word. And here was this box uh, by Bloomberg that, in numbers at least, was delivering context and perspective um, numerically. Relative value is what it was about. It was showing people what was cheap, what was expensive in the markets. And uh, that's why I say it was a cause of great anxiety for me. And mm. um, it, more anxiety when I learned um, in 1987 that Bloomberg, through a, an arrangement he had made, was going to supply government bond prices and yields to the Wall Street Journal every day, supplanting what had been a practice for decades with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And I thought this was terrible because Dow Jones, the parent of the Wall Street Journal, owned something called Tellerate, which was far bigger, was the system of choice. And my blood back then was Dow Jones red. So the idea that this upstart Bloomberg was going to supplant uh, Tellerate, which was uh, a Dow Jones product, uh, to me was heresy. And yeah. I tried to um, persuade people uh, that this was not a good idea. I failed. In fact, I was, uh, I was told to just be happy and go away. Um, and, a, and a few months later, I found myself uh, having lunch with a very good colleague, friend, who covered technology, and he mentioned Bloomberg to me. He said, have you ever heard of Bloomberg? And of course I said, I heard of Bloomberg and told him the whole story about uh, what I had encountered. And we decided we were going to do a story about information technology and Wall Street and oh. how information technology was transforming Wall Street. And we figured the, the best subject would be a company that people hadn't heard of. We would introduce this company, uh, so to speak. Uh, in the in the Wall Street Journal, and that's when I called Mike Bloomberg as a reporter from the Wall Street Journal. I said, "Hi, it's Winkler. We're doing this story. I think you might want to talk to us." And uh, that led to a front page profile of Bloomberg. And then a year and four months later, I found myself working for him. Wow! So first you recognized sort of disruptive technology, which is now a phrase probably wasn't even used at that time, but as a real indicator of how much it can change society. You identified Bloomberg as, as that one, and then you wrote about him, and then you created a whole new industry. Tell me what that conversation was like with him. What was the vision you both had? Well, Bloomberg didn't lack for confidence, which is one <laughs> of his great, is one of his great attributes is that he didn't lack for confidence. Now fortunately he has unlimited smarts to go with the confidence. So that's a 
really effective combination mm -hmm. when you think about it. He was very smart and he was very confident. He was very perceptive about one thing that I recognized was missing in the entire uh, media landscape. Mm -hmm. it, he recognized that um, if you took data, because he was a you know physics major, scientist by training, if you took data, you could look at things from a historical perspective all the way to the present. And you could go back in time. You could figure out uh, what if scenarios based on historical values, prices, for example. And so what he did was, in effect, if you like, take all of the prices and yields that, that were in the Wall Street Journal for decades. He put them in a computer. And he told people whether things were cheap or expensive on any given day. Now, the reason why that was so significant, I knew it was significant, is because when a, uh, a firm like Solomon Brothers, where he worked before he started Bloomberg, would call the state of Florida or the state of California retirement system and say, you ought to buy the 10 and a halfs of 2016 and you ought to sell the 11s of 2017. Those are two government securities. And the, uh, the person at the other end of the line, the state of Florida or uh, California, would say, no, that's not a good trade today. That was a good trade last week. Why didn't you call me last week? And the reason why they knew that is because they had a Bloomberg, which you could tell them instantly. So what Bloomberg had done was he had given the most important fiduciaries in the world the understanding, the awareness, this is what journalists are supposed to do, by the way, right. to understand relative value. Um, and it was a breakthrough. And there was nothing like it. And he did it in the most important market in the world, the U.S. government securities market, which was telling all the other markets what to do. Now, what I said to Bloomberg was, when he, he realized he needed to be in the news business, he couldn't just do, if you will, data. He had to have news, because if he didn't have his own news, he would have to rent somebody else's news. And he didn't want to rent, he wanted to control his destiny. Mm. So, because he didn't want somebody to raise the rent on him. So, uh, when we talked, um, you know, I said, what you've already done is unique. And if you marry news with the relative value system that you have, that would be a combination that doesn't exist anywhere else. And, you know, when you, we thought about that, that was really extraordinary because I had come from a company like Dow Jones, which had been around since the uh, last decade of the uh, 19th century. Um, Reuters had been around since uh, Napoleon III. Uh, so, you know, the idea that Bloomberg was capable of creating something in news that didn't exist, that no media company had thought to do, was really quite palpable to us, but also tantalizing. And so what we set about to do, and what I was thinking about back then, was the more we could combine all of this data with narrative journalism, mm -hmm. the more authoritative it would be, the more definitive it would be, and definitely actionable. Because, you know, what we would be showing people, say, you know, here's where things are with traditional reporting, but we would also be able to show at the same time that this was numerically, you know, verified. This was empirically validated. And uh, that's how we started. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we didn't have a lot to begin with, but the system gradually, uh, you know, got bigger and we won customers and uh, here we are. What was the breakthrough moment when people realized they needed um, information and data together? Bloomberg started as an aggregator. So he had data that he collected. He had other people's data that he provided on the system. He had news from all kinds of uh, outlets um, and third parties that would charge customers, Bloomberg customers, a fee to get their product on his system. Hmm. Many of those were news organizations. And the breakthrough moment was when uh, customers of Bloomberg said, I don't need those other things because I get everything that I want or need from Bloomberg News at no extra charge. And so when he heard that, uh, he realized he had done what he had hoped he would do. And then built up. And that happened, company. by the way, relatively early. It was 1991 when really? that happened. Wow, that was, because you really started this. It was, it was uh, nine, ten months into wow. our startup. Wow. 
And you've continued to grow, and that is like you have a big presence in Washington now, and you're collecting data around government and that kind of thing. So it's, the vision was, in one place, information that could serve many customers in a way, right? Or you is know, it different? You know how you can think of us? How? And, and it's very much the way, actually, a journalist works, a good journalist works. We're collecting data points. The more data points we collect, the more convinced we are we know what we have in front of us. So if we are complete in the way we go about collecting data points, now that could be the same as a reporter collecting anecdotes, interviewing you know everybody who was at the scene of an accident, uh, it's no different. The wondrous, wonderful thing about Bloomberg is that we have the ability to collect lots of data. It doesn't matter what kind of data. It could be financial data, it could be health data, it could be anyone's data. As long as we have that data, then we have the ability, once we have it, to write all kinds of pieces, stories, that inform people about relative value of money in all its forms, relative value of economies in all their forms, any subject you like. Government is especially important because, sadly, our government, most governments are opaque. They're not transparent, and yet governments are at the center of everything. And so, you know, our initiative in Washington is to really make transparent everything that the government does in a financial uh, or economic sense. And of course, if we do that, we're going to make the government more understandable to people, for better or for worse. And that's a service that people will pay for. We're, he we're here to do that. <laughs> Foreign policy, you haven't gotten into that deeply yet. Is that in the future? Um, we are actually to the extent that, you know, we pay attention to anything that affects economies or markets. Mm. And so, you know, we're traveling with the Secretary of State. Um, wherever there's a, um, a government that is under siege, we're generally covering uh, that event uh, as it's unfolding, whether it's the Arab Spring um, or, um, you know, an election somewhere. Um, so. That's always been a part of our focus, and um, you know, I think that you know, going forward, it will only increase. Audiences, you think of it as the business audience, and they're able to afford the the terminal, which can be expensive. But do you think of yourself now as having a much wider audience? Because I can go on and get Bloomberg News if I just type in your you know URL. You know, I never felt that um, we were limited okay. by focusing on markets, the economy, money in all its forms. And the reason why I say that is if you think about those things in particular and you follow them uh, to the end of the line, where it takes you is everywhere. It takes you to health, it takes you to science, it takes you to culture, it takes you to politics mm -hmm. and policy, it takes you to every conceivable subject. And so as Bloomberg News grew, uh, by the way, we dropped the middle name. We used to be called Bloomberg Business News, and we just called ourselves Bloomberg News because really what we were covering ultimately was everything that mattered to people. And if we weren't covering everything that mattered to people, we weren't doing our jobs right. Hmm. Back to the paper boy. Um, you're not on paper. I mean, you do have some magazines in Washington, I know that, but you're, you're online. You're wistful at all for that paper, or is it well, just actually, moved off? Well, actually, we are in hundreds of newspapers. Okay. Uh, uh, Bloomberg News is syndicated all over the world. Um, there probably isn't a country of consequence anywhere that doesn't have a newspaper that isn't publishing Bloomberg News. So we're there. Uh, we don't have our own newspaper in a traditional sense, but we are an electronic newspaper. And we do have two magazines, a monthly magazine called Bloomberg Markets and uh, has a healthy international circulation uh, north of uh, 350,000. And we also have a magazine you've heard of called uh, Bloomberg Business Week, mm -hmm. uh, which is more than 80 years old. And uh, we bought it uh, For a, good price. a couple of years back. <laughs> and it's having a wonderful renaissance. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, rebirth uh, as Bloomberg Business Week. So in all this creative destruction, it's not just an either or. There's different, we're gonna see it on all platforms. Yeah, for us, it's always been about the story. And we so love the story, we are eager to see the story displayed any which way, uh, in print, electronically, in a magazine, in broadcast, mm -hmm. audio, video, any way you want it, we're there to help you get the story. Um, last question. 
Anything you see in the next 10 years that's a big change? Just bigger for Bloomberg News? Different? You know, I think the challenge for us um, increasingly is going to be the precision with which we're able to um, reveal very difficult or complicated uh, mm -hmm. events. Uh, the world's a much more complicated place. I think we have some advantages because we're very internationally minded at Bloomberg. You know, we're, we're uh, in 150 bureaus. Uh, most of us in Bloomberg News are not American. Most of us mm. are outside the United States. Most of us speak English as a second language. I think that international mindedness and our ability to follow markets everywhere gives us an opportunity to cover very difficult things as they're unfolding and to see things that otherwise might be missed. Um, the best thing of all is that you're so optimistic about the news business because those of us who love news, and love journalism, you know, that's well, what we want as a future. Yeah, I mean, I think in this wonderful 21st century uh, of spontaneous expression where people can say anything and they do <laughs> and deliver it instantly and they do, uh, the rigor with which journalists seek out information and make sure that it's accurate, accuracy above all else, is, uh, you know, invaluable and will increasingly be prized. And I think that the news organizations that are dedicated to that are actually going to do well because they're going to separate themselves from people saying things that aren't true and that are misleading. And, you know, ultimately what it's about is people want to be able to make decisions uh, that they can trust. Um, and so the idea of actionable news is what we're all about, and that's why I, I think we do have a future. And I love that word, trust, because that bond with the public who can trust what we give. And I'm very pleased to know that there are a lot of students from our classes each year graduating and going to Bloomberg News. Well, thank you very that, much. Well, I'm glad you trust our graduates. Matt Winkler, great to have you here. Thank you.